From Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. Uh, Hugh Bryan, Mr. Dollar. How are you this morning? Not so good. I didn't sleep very well. How'd you do? I think I have about what you want on John Reardon. Well, if you haven't, I can get it from Mrs. Reardon. What? Well, I thought you didn't want to tell her about the report, that her husband might still be alive. She knows. She overheard us talking last night. Oh. Well, what do you want to do? I might as well look at what you have and get this over with. How about an hour from now? I'll be waiting for you. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Baltimore, Maryland. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Chesapeake fraud matter. Expense account item six, dollar and a half. One collect telegram from Denver, Colorado. I've located Frank Bowers as per your request. Cursory investigation discloses little evidence that would lead me to believe he might be the John Ridden of Baltimore. Looks like a ham bone to me, Johnny. What do I do now? Signed, George Hanley, George Hanley Investigations Incorporated, Denver, Colorado. Item seven, two dollars, same thing. Telegram from me. Things are about the same way here. Sit tight, I'll see you in a day or two. Love, Johnny. Once the telegrams were out of the way, I walked three blocks from my hotel to the office building of Hugh Bryan. It was an impressive place full of lawyers and doctors. Hugh Bryan looked a little haggard when I saw him. It took me a while to get all this together. Half the night. There wasn't that big a rush. Oh, get it out of the way. The sooner you have what you need, the sooner you can make sure, and the sooner I won't worry about it anymore. Uh, did you talk to Elizabeth yet today? No, just last night. Oh, I thought maybe she might have called you this morning. I'm... Uh, I'm so sorry for that girl. Well, don't feel too bad, Mr. Bryan. We both did everything we could to keep the report that her husband might be alive from her. Awkward as it was. Yes, I know, I know. I still don't understand it, I guess. Well, a man named Coombs, an insurance official, thinks he saw Reardon in Denver last week using the name Frank Bowers. He's sure that Bowers was Reardon. If he turns out to be Reardon, the insurance company's been taken for $20,000 they paid to Elizabeth Reardon, just to set you straight. That'd make Elizabeth party to a fraud. And John... Lord knows that's silly. Well, silly or not. Yes. Well, here's what I have. Now, uh, this is one of the last pictures taken of John Reardon. Mm-hmm. Have the negatives? Yes. Uh, here. And these are some vital statistics on him. The physical part I got from his doctor. Mm -hmm. He stood an examination about a month before the accident. This the doctor's name here? Yes. Now, these other things are in his background and education. Uh, here, a copy of his marriage license, birth certificate. How did you get hold of these things? Well, I handled a lot of business for John, filed a lot of his papers for him. These were just packed away. It took a while to find them. Hey. Hmm? A copy of his fingerprints? Well, would those help? More than any of this other stuff. Fingerprints aren't standard papers in anybody's file. Before John went in the Army, he did some engineering work for the proving grounds in Aberdeen. Oh. He was fingerprinted there. It was a gag at the time. He had a set of his own blown up and put on the wall in a picture frame. You know, just a joke. Yeah. I dug them out of his personal things. Now then, here's a copy of his financial records, tax returns and whatnot. I spent about an hour in Hugh Bryan's office going over material that would help me in the investigation. The pictures and fingerprints were the most helpful items. After I'd finished, I went back to my hotel, packed my bags and checked out. <laughs> Expense account item eight, $398. My hotel and incidentals in Baltimore and plane fare to Denver. I got there at nine in the morning. The air crisp, thin, and full of sunshine. I rented a car at the airport and drove into town. A half an hour later, I was talking to my detective friend, George Handel. How do you like Denver, old pal? I haven't been here for a few years. It doesn't look the same. Bigger and better, huh? They're thinking of putting up buildings as big as those mountains over there. I love it. So's the wife. I'm glad. You ought to try a place like this for a while, Johnny. Uh, maybe I will. Ought to find yourself a girl and settle down. Uh, let's us settle down, Georgie. Huh? Oh, sure. How'd it go? 
You asked me to look into Frank Bowers. I looked into him as much as I could without talking to him. There you are, Johnny. His bank account, his friends, his troubles, his enemies, everything. Mm -hmm. How about his police record? One traffic violation two years ago. Never been in any kind of trouble around here. Gets along fine with everybody. Well, tell me about everybody, Georgie. His laundryman, the milkman, the guy who tends bar in his neighborhood, the man he buys gas from. I talked to all of them. How about the people he works with? Well, he don't do much of that as far as I can see. He's got an office downtown, calls himself a consulting engineer. Goes there once or twice a week to pick up his mail. Well, now, that's a very nice way to be able to live. Is he starving to death, Georgie? No, he's got a good bank account. Makes regular deposits. Money comes from a New York bonding firm. He owns a little two-bedroom house out beyond Park Hill. Paid $38,000 for it. Wow. Sleeps in one bedroom, uses the other one for a kind of studio, putters around with clay, oils, and according to the nosy dame who lives across the street, he tries to write. How about his friends? Lots of them. Pays his bills, gets drunk now and then, normal. Tell me about his wife. He hasn't got one. Lives alone. Find out who he goes with, Georgie? No. As much as I could find out, he doesn't go with anybody. Enemies? Well, the guy in the cleaning shop hates his guts. Bowers doesn't like his shirts with starch. (laughs) Did you check out the residency business? As far as I could. He bought that house out in Park Hill in 1951. Paid cash for it. Record of the sale gives his former residence is Toledo, Ohio. Well, how long has he been a resident here? As near as I can figure, and this is just rough, four or five years ago, the first financial transaction was the house he bought. The next was a car. He could have been here a long time before that, though. Well, the time element would fit for Reardon. What do you think, Georgie? I think you're probably wasting a lot of money investigating this guy. He doesn't seem like the kind of man who's hiding out from anybody. Here, look at this photo. Is this Frank Bowers? Yeah, yeah, I'd say so. 5'11", 170, olive complexion, no scars, no glasses, brown hair, about 35. Could be him from that, yes. This is a picture of John Reardon, and the description is Reardon's. What do you want to do now? Keep on it. I got George Hanley busy making a check with some people in Toledo who could find out whether or not a Frank Bauer had once lived there. Then I took my rented car and drove out to the address Hanley had given me. It was in the east side of the city near the airport, a one-story frame house, a 53 Merc in the driveway. I'm looking for Mr. Frank Bowers. Oh, who are you? Johnny Dollar. Oh, I'm Frank Bauer. Well, I'm an insurance investigator, Mr. Bowers. I'd like to talk to you. Oh, come on in. Thank you. Take chair anywhere, huh? Son, you might. Just making a routine check, Mr. Bowers. Thought perhaps you could help me. (laughs) I don't know anything about my neighbors, if that's that kind of thing. No, I'm running down a report that came across our office in Baltimore. Baltimore? Ever been there, Mr. Bowers? No. Swell place on Chesapeake Bay. Well, I like Denver. (laughs) What's this all about? Well, do you happen to remember a few days ago when you were at a place called the Ship's Tavern? Well, that's in the Brown Palace. This was uh, last Friday, to be exact. Should I remember? What I do, steal an ashtray or walk out on a check? No, a, a man from Baltimore was there that day, Mr. Bowers. His name was Coombs. Paul Coombs. You met him. Well, did I? Yes, right at the bar. You had a drink or two with him. Well, I might have. I don't know whether to admit it or not. What are you getting at? I, I don't understand this. I know it seems confusing. Uh, uh, maybe this will help. Take a look at this. Mm-hmm. Now, you must admit, you look a great deal like the man in that picture. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose I do. Well, I'll be darned. Hey, I'd do it that. You know, this could be a picture of me. That's why I'm here, Mr. Bowers. You see, the company I represent insured the man in this picture for quite an amount of money. His name was John Reardon. He was lost in a boat accident in Chesapeake Bay five years ago. The Mr. Coombs who met you at the bar here last week thought you were John Reardon. Well, I don't blame him. But I'm not. Close, though. Now, want to smoke? Oh, thanks. Thanks. Sure. Mr. Coombs was a lifelong friend of John Reardon's. I have his sworn statement here about that meeting with you and the certainty of his identity. You do? Yes, right here. Would you like to see it? (laughs) Not particularly. I understand you went to Ohio State. What year did you graduate? I didn't go to Ohio State. Look, what is this, huh? Well, that's what you told Mr. Coombs. It's in the statement. Oh, I remember that bird now. Oh, I might have told him anything, Mr. Dollar. You know, he's one of those inquisitive kind, real sure of himself. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Look, don't tell me they sent you all the way out here from Baltimore. They did. 
On that guy's say so? <laughs> mm hmm. <laughs> That's funny. Did you go to college, Mr. Bowers? What? I'd like to clear up that detail. Did you go to college? Well, yes, yes. I went to Carnegie Tech, 36 through 40. You haven't lived all your life in Colorado, then. Where else have you lived? Look, do you have any right to ask me questions like this? No, no, but you'll help me a lot if you'll answer them. Well, why not? Okay, I've lived in New York, Pittsburgh, Kansas City, Toledo, around the country. Came here a few years ago with my health. Seemed good for my asthma. Ever been married? Once in 1942. It didn't last long. Oh, what else do you want to know? Well, look, you in a hurry? I can come back later. No, no, you... it's not that. It's Well, look, you seem like a nice guy, Dollar, but it just makes me uncomfortable answering these questions of yours. I appreciate the time you've given me already, Mr. Bauer. Please understand, it's a matter of establishing identity. But you know who I am. I just told you. That's true. I don't like this business much. Is there, is there any way you can eliminate it? The most positive identification would be from fingerprints. Oh, huh? Now, Mr. Bauer, I'm not so much interested in who you are as in proving that you're not John Reardon. If you volunteered a set of fingerprints, it'd save me a great deal of work and you a great deal of trouble. Well, sure, why not? We drove downtown together to George Hanley's office and used the portable fingerprint kit. I took a complete set of Frank Bauer's prints he attached. I thanked him for his time and trouble, and he left. If he was trying to cover something, it certainly wasn't apparent from his conversational reactions. There had been a moment when I was sure he wasn't Frank Bauer. On the other hand, I was sure that he wasn't John Ritten. That cuts it, Johnny. Right thumb and index prints don't match at all. <sighs> oh, not even close, George. And I thought I was getting somewhere. I found out he was never in Toledo, or at least never registered or licensed as an engineer. Well, these prints do it. When are you going home, Johnny? Oh, I don't know. There's no reason to stick around any longer. This is crazy. You proved your case with the prints. He was too anxious to help me prove it, Georgie. You ask any ordinary man on the street two personal questions about himself, and he'll tell you to go jump in the lake. You ask him for his fingerprints, and he's liable to smash you. So? Get on him. Stay with him 24 hours a day. Get a couple of other men. It'll cost you money. Get busy. <laughs> Expense account item nine, $200, detective service. I didn't believe Frank Bowers. I didn't believe his background. And most of all, I didn't believe his fingerprints. Johnny Dollar. This is Western Union, Mr. Dollar. Message for you from Baltimore, Maryland. Okay, go ahead. Received your air special regarding investigation of the Chesapeake matter. You've proved Frank Bowers of Denver is not John Reardon of Baltimore. Fingerprints don't lie, therefore logical to believe John Reardon really dead. Come on home, your expenses are running too high. That's signed Pat Kelleher, Universal Adjustment Bureau. Or should I mail this to you? No, that's all right. Can I send an answer? Yes, sir. Pat Kelleher, Universal Adjustment Bureau, Baltimore, Maryland. Fingerprints don't lie, but people do. All the time. For all sorts of reasons. It may be finished as far as you're concerned, but I'm just beginning. Love, Johnny. I'd sent out to prove that John Reardon had not died back in 1950 in a boat accident on Chesapeake Bay. To prove that he was still very much alive in the person of one Frank Bowers currently living here in Denver, Colorado. Everything, all I could learn of the man's history, reports from his neighbors, friends, even his fingerprints, everything indicated he really was Frank Bowers. And yet, for some fool reason or other, I wasn't convinced. Expense account continued. Item 10, 63 bucks for one overcoat. Denver can be a very cold city when the wind comes in from the north and it decides to snow. Almost as cold as the damp wind off Chesapeake Bay on a certain day back in 1950. Hi. Hiya, George. How's it going? Well, I watched Bauer's house from six last night till two this morning. He read a book last night in the living room. He made a phone call, and then he went to bed. And then I went home and went to bed. How many men have you got working? Two others beside myself. We're keeping an eye on Bauer's round the clock. I go on again at six. Okay, good. 
I don't know why, Johnny. He isn't your guy and you know it. Fingerprints proved it. We can watch him from now till doomsday and nothing's going to change that. Oh, look, don't you start, Georgie. Huh? I got a wire from my home office this morning telling me to close it up and come on home. Why don't you close it up and come on home? I like to make dough. I'm in the private detective business, but I hate to see an old pal doing a lot of work on nothing. Why don't you shut up? Sure. We can go on like this forever, can't we, Johnny? Ah. Goodbye, Johnny. I walked around the streets of Denver trying to enjoy the sights. But mostly, I wasn't enjoying anything. I was thinking about the whole case from beginning to end. And my only reason for hanging on and being stubborn about it was the fact that Frank Bowers had been too anxious to cooperate. Too anxious to help me prove so easily that he was not John Reardon. And then something else happened. He got anxious once more. Yeah? Mr. Dollar, this is Frank Bowers. Oh, hello. You didn't tell me where you were stopping. Phoned everywhere in town. <laughs> Wondered how you made out. Made out? Yeah, with my fingerprints. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, they don't match at all. Oh, then I'm not your man. Guess not, Mr. Bowers. Well, I was just curious. Didn't hear from you after you took the sample of my prints. Well, that was pretty nice of you to help me out. Uh, how can I thank you? Could buy me a drink if you want to. Hey, you're on. All right, meet you at six at the ship's tavern. It was the voice of a confident man again. An overconfident man. The kind who sandbags in a poker game. Who knows about a boat ride and a horse race. And so help me, I knew I was right about him. Expense account item 11, $14, booze. For Frank Bowers and myself in the ship's tavern. The same bar, incidentally, where a week before, a close friend of the deceased John Reardon had run into Bowers and sworn he was John Reardon. When Bowers came in, he was followed by George Hanley, as per my instructions. I saw George pick a stool at the far end of the bar. Well, I suppose you'll be packing up and leaving the old Mile High City pretty quick now, huh? Did I say that, Frank? No, no, but I just suppose it. You will, won't you? Oh, I haven't decided yet. What do you think I should do? Huh? I said, what do you think I should do? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Well, maybe I'm just kidding myself. But you don't seem like the kind of fellow you should be somehow. No, I don't. No. Now, you were too nice about answering questions when I came out to your house the other day. Too nice about letting me fingerprint you so I could compare the samples with John Reardon's prints. Too nice about calling up and asking how it all came out. Came out bad, thank you. <laughs> I'm a pretty nice fella. <laughs> yeah, that's what the book says. <laughs> uh, what book? I had a private detective friend make one up on you before I even got here. Friends, enemies, money, and whatnot. All very nice. Mm, of course it is. You know what your trouble is, Dolly? You, you don't trust anybody. I'm a nice fella, and you don't trust me. You don't believe what you see. I believe the fingerprints don't match, if that's what you mean. You're the bird I don't believe. Hey, should I get sore? If you want to. <laughs> I'm not gonna. You know why? Because I'm a nice fellow. <laughs> sure you are. But you ought to get mad when a man calls you a liar. Oh, you didn't call me a liar. I meant to. You're a liar. You know what? I'm not a nice fellow all the time. I kind of like to hit you in the face or something right now. You're needling me. Am I? Uh-huh. I think I better call up a girl I know, see what she's doing for dinner. Well, see if she's got a friend. No, no, you're too nasty, friend. You sit tight. Order me a drink. I'll be back in a jiffy. He's a little drunk. Sure he is, George. He's also worried. Any particular reason for getting him that way, Johnny? Yes, he's using the booth in the lobby. Scoot out there and see if you can get a line on who he might be calling. Right. A long ten minutes later, Frank Bowers came back to the bar. He was weaving a little when he got on the stool next to me. George Hanley followed him back inside and took his place at the end of the bar again. Uh, she's busy. Took her a long time to tell you that. She's a girl who takes a long time with everything. Oh, what's your name? 
Matt? What's her name? The girl you just called. Oh, Rita. Rita. Well, here's to Rita. Come on, drink up. You might have to eat with me. I don't want to drink to Rita, and I don't want to have dinner with you. What do you think of that? I thought you were a nice fella. Remember? God of places. Hold on. Hey! You may have something with this bird at that. How come, George? That call he just made long distance to Baltimore. I got that much. He said he'd never been there. Didn't know anyone there. Keep an eye on us, Georgie. You bet your pal. Hey. Hey, Frank. Hey, hey, look. What's the matter, friend? I just left you. I thought for good. Oh, come on. I'll buy you dinner. You buy me nothing, Dollar. Go on back to Baltimore. Why don't you? What? Why don't you go back to Baltimore? What's that supposed to mean? Just what it means. Well? Uh, maybe we better talk some more. Fine, fine. My car is in the lot here. Okay. You're after me, aren't you? Well, let's say I met you yesterday to get some facts. Let's say I drank with you tonight to find out what kind of a guy you are. I've done most of the talking up to date. Now it's your turn. Mm -hmm. Well? I don't know whether I got anything to say to you. Oh, make up your mind, will you? Look, suppose I were John Ridden. I'm not. But suppose I were. I can't tell you what a court would do about an insurance fraud. No. No, well, you're just a clumsy ox stumbling around for some answers and you haven't got any yet. Get out of my way. Wait a minute. Hey! Get out! Didn't want to interfere, Johnny. Stay on him. See where he goes, what he does, Georgie. Hurry. You all right, pal? Sure. Hurry. I wasn't all right at all. Frank Bowers was not only big but fast, and he caught me off guard. I went back through the hotel lobby up to my room and lay down on the bed, and I waited for the phone to ring. Sooner or later, it'd be George Hanley or Frank Bowers' tale reporting some development that had solved the whole case. But the phone didn't ring. Nothing happened. No one phoned. No one came by. I went to sleep about one o'clock. The next morning, George Hanley called and asked me how I was feeling after the punching session in the parking lot. He reported that Frank Bowers had jumped in his car, driven straight home, and gone straight to bed. Expense account item 12, 48 cents, postage. Cost of mailing a sample of Bowers' fingerprints to Washington, D.C. At 8 o'clock that night, I had another phone call. Hi, baby. This is George Hanley. How do you feel? Okay. What's up, Georgie? I'm still keeping my eye on Frank Bowers. He's nervous, all right. Been staying in the house all day. I can see him walking back and forth in the living room. He must have smoked a package of cigarettes every hour. Uh-huh. Has he used the phone? Yeah, yeah. Looks like long-distance stuff again. You know, place the call, hang up, then wait for the operator to call back. Hmm. Possibly Baltimore again. Possible. How about it? I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Where are you? Right across the street from his house. Be right out. The heater in my rented car wasn't working that night. I remember that part very well. My feet and hands were numb with the ten below weather when I flicked off the lights and pulled up alongside George Hanley, stationed across the street from Frank Bowers' home. Yeah, it's some weather. Yeah. How's Bower doing? I think he's got a visitor with him now, Johnny. Must have showed up while I was calling you. Big guy wrapped in an overcoat. I've seen him move around the room a couple of times. George, let's go in and shake him up. I'm tired of all this. You think he's reared? I don't know, but I want to wind it up one way or the other. Okay. You want to wait for his friend to leave? Nope. Oh, it's a nutty thing. You're the one who's nutty. You already proved he isn't John Reardon. That's all you wanted. I know, I know. Now I want to prove I'm getting old and crotchety and don't believe what I see in here. Bear with me, Georgie. Sure, pal. You're crazy, but I love you. Hey. Huh? Visitor's leaving. Make him? No. An overcoat and a hat aren't much to go on. He's... Georgie, come on! Hey, Johnny, look out! down, the gun of the man in the overcoat had gone off a couple more times. The nearest bullet came six inches from the ground. Without my gun, all I could do was hug the ground for cover and try to stay out of his line of fire. The shot stiffened me for a moment. When my hearing came back, I heard someone very close to me. It was Georgie. He was dying.
There'll be another exciting episode in our story of the Chesapeake fraud matter tomorrow. Tomorrow? Proof that an insurance case is one thing. Murder of a pal is something else. Tomorrow, the wind-up. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs>